good coffee. Hey folks, Mike here from TA Outdoors. You join me here at the Bushcraft Camp on a fine English snow day uh, down in the south of England. Very, really quite rare. This is the second time we've had a decent amount of snowfall this year, which is great, for, great for me anyway, because it gives me a chance to come out and enjoy the peaceful solitude of the woodland. Camp is holding up fairly well, to be honest. Uh, I had to get rid of a load of snow on the tarp. It was weighing the tarp down, and it's actually uh, put a lot of pressure on some of the knots. And some are they're holding up okay, but it looks like it's sagged a bit since that. So there's some work to do, that's for sure. The shelters themselves, they've uh, kept the snow out. One of them's had a bit more snow in where I think this, the wind has blown it in off the branches of the trees. The other one is completely covered. I call this one the moss shelter. This one here, you can see underneath, there's absolutely zero snow in that. Hunting towers all intact, the ladder's intact. Everything else seem, seems to be intact. There is one wall here where my backpack is that's um, collapsed, but that's okay. I think that's just built where some of the sticks that I used were quite rotten. It's minus five at the moment, so it's fairly chilly, certainly for this region in the south of England. I've got the fire going, I've got a nice cup of coffee in a, in a cookser, and uh, I'm just letting it burn down to some coals now, because I'm going to cook up some mackerel fillets, uh, which should be nice. They've got some seasoning on them and everything, so I'm looking forward to that, and I'm just going to enjoy some peaceful solitude here in the woodland. You can hear the, uh, the crows and some rooks. I've seen a red kite fly past. It's peaceful out here. It's really, really nice. Couldn't think of anywhere else I'd want to be right now. For those that are new to the channel, this is I did a whole I done a whole 13 part series of building this camp here over the past few years. Uh, every single piece of wood is dead that I've used in the camp. It's all dead wood. I haven't chopped. The trees that I have chopped down have had no branches on the top, they were dead. Uh, but most of it is actually dead fall or dead standing, just lying around on the floor as well. And yeah, it's been, a, it's been a hell of a project, it's been really good, really enjoyed it. And now there's sort of less building work to do, it's more coming out to enjoy it. There's obviously little bits I'd like to add, but feel free to pop in the comments section anything else you'd add to the, uh, to the camp. So one of the things I was doing just a minute ago before uh, my coffee was ready was sharpening my axe and I use just a, a sharpening puck it's got a coarse side like that and a fine side Canada geese they're right at home here now it's snowing and the fine side I was just using the fine side because uh, you probably won't see this but where I look for any nicks or flecks just by moving the edge of the blade side to side in the right light so it's hard when the sun's not out but as long as you've got a light source you can see so I can still see there's some uh, nicks and flecks there when I'm doing this side of the blade I like to tuck it into my shoulder this is just my way of doing it there's other ways obviously I like to tuck it into my collarbone up here close my left eye because I'm only looking down this right hand side or will be your left hand side but this one side meet the angle of the blade or the bit to the edge of the stone make sure it's just touching oh a bit of saliva as well you can use water sorry I know it seems rude that I'm splitting but there's a purpose to it once I've met that blade and I can check there it is I keep that angle and I start with really small circles and the reason for the really small circles is so that I know I'm in contact with the edge of the blade and it's getting that muscle retention back I don't want to sort of just rip around the, uh, the, the point there I'm just slowly checking everything's in line I'm doing small circles I don't do a certain amount of circles 18 one side 18 the other side I just keep going until I feel there's a good enough burr there until I move on to the other side once you get going then you can get to long smoother slow motions and when I come to the edge of the bit here I lean out just to check that's touching you want to roll the edge over too much lovely soothing sound and then I just flip it over I can see there's a burr there already for this side I just hold the edge the axe you can rest it on your knee to keep it nice and still check that the blade the bit is meeting and then just small circles again 
There's obviously loads of ways to do this, guys, I appreciate that. This is just my way. It's probably not the best way, but it's my way and it works. So I'll just show you. I'm on, the, I'm on a wide angle lens here, so hopefully you can see this, but if you look, there's the, there's the, this is what the blade looked like previously, and this is what it's like. I've still got some nicks in here. That's why I'm working on it, but this is the shinier part here, if it will focus. This part here, this is where I've just sharpened this shiny part there. I don't know, I've taken away that material and you can see it's like a, it's created like a slurry. So, I could use that straight up, that would be fine to use, and it would cut no problem. But I do like to strop a little bit just to get rid of some of that burr, so I know it's a nice sharp point. I don't want to make it too, the angle too steep, because axe has, the axe has a lot of weight behind it. And if that angle's really fine, almost like a, a Scandi grind knife, like really, really fine, it's more likely that the point's going to be able to roll over as you hit it with all that weight, it's going to roll that point over. So I don't like to make it too, too uh, fine the angle, but this is a fairly fat, it doesn't look it, but it's a fairly fat hatchet, this one. It's a two pound head, or nearly, almost a two pound head. Really well balanced though, as you can see. And it's actually one of the cheaper versions of Axe. This is just the Husqvarna hatchet hobby. I've had this absolutely years, and I always come back to it. So let me just, uh, the next thing, I've got a knife to show you as well in a minute, an absolute beast, which you saw earlier. But the next stage is actually, I need my belt. So I'm gonna take this off, slide the knife off, slide the axe loop, by the way, and the belt was made for me by Brian at Journeyman Handcraft. He custom made this all to my liking. He can do custom made bushcraft bits. I'll pop a link in the description below. He's my friend, uh, really nice guy. And he makes really nice, good quality bushcraft equipment. In this pouch here, I keep various a lighter, various uh, lengths of paracord, hanks of paracord, and also some stropping compound or smurf poo, as it's called over here in the UK. I don't know about globally where it's called, but this is a uh, stropping compound, and this goes on your leather strop. Or for me, this is this is a leather strop. The belt, the ins, the suede sort of part of the belt, the inside. And all I do, if I show you this. Hopefully you can see, okay. I don't do it up near the holes, I do it down near here. I just scribble it in. Get a good amount of compound on there. Goes a long way, this stuff. It's pretty tough. Come a little bit. Obviously, I only need to really go the width of the lock because that's as uh, that's as much as I can draw the blade across. <sighs> I'm not going to put too much pressure on this. I'm just going to simply draw. Stand that way, you can see. Just draw the axe across it. Keeping that angle that I did before, so that's, that's the blade flat. Obviously, the, the bevel of the blade isn't touching the leather there. If I tilt it up slightly, it's just touching. If I tilt it too much and push hard, I'm going to really roll that edge again, and you'd be surprised how much you do roll it. So I'm just gently... I'm really not putting too much pressure on here because I'm only getting rid of those that burr of metal. Again, like I say, it's just my way of doing it. Same again with the other side. Up to you how you want to hold the axe. I like to hold this side right by the head. I've got lots of control of it. You can use a stropping block or a stropping stick, which you can also make yourself. I'm aware of those. 
I do have them at home, but this is for out in the field. I don't want to end up carrying extra equipment. The belt's already on me anyway, so I may as well use it. It's got multiple uses then. I don't know if you can see that. It's starting to shine a bit there now, on that edge. Obviously I could end up polishing all this bit if I want to, but that bit I'm not fussed about. It's just this tiny edge bit here, and that's now much sharper. Obviously be wary running your finger down the edge of a blade, guys. Here's the loop, absolute. There's the knife, which we'll talk about in a bit. I'll show you this beauty of a knife. It's nice to have the belt on the outside. It just helps you access your tools a little bit better. I'm pretty pleased with that axe for now, out in the field. When I'm at home, I can sharpen that a lot better. That's how the belt loop works. Keeps the axe there. Other belt loop. Got a knife. First, let's get some Macrodon. Another friend of mine, UK guy, made me this grill cover. Uh, it's waxed canvas, oil skin. And this grill is a really cheapy one from Amazon. It's, it's got legs to it, but I'm not really a fan of the legs. It can warp a bit in the middle, but that's okay as long as it holds the food up. I'm just gonna have it flat. To warm it up first. Pop a link to Tim's stuff as well in the description. So this is a mackerel. <coughs> Smoked already, but it's peri peri. I've got some peri peri on there. At the moment, there's a bit too much flame. So it's gonna lie these on the edge a bit. Get it warmed up. Very, very macro. Oh, that looks good. Oh, she's burning. They are looking good and done. Peri Peri Mackerel. It's my plate <laughs> for today. Oh. Looks so good. Haven't had mackerel well since summer really. falls apart. So this is camp for those that haven't seen it. Logs are over there, getting low on logs because we're back end of winter now. Kitcheny area here, top roof which I would like to change to put more permanent roof eventually. This was Camp Update 13, the film, where we built this large now primary lean-to shelter, fire pit, more log storage in Jax's little house, dog house over there, moss shelter, that one over there, hunting tower. This was a little perspex, well, bit of a plastic bag, really, recycled plastic bag could be used as a window for this shelter. There's the tower, which is only accessible from the ladder inside. This is the moss lean-to, you can see the moss just under there. A lot of weight on that lean-to now. And there's the hunting tower with the ladder. I keep this black sheet on top of the logs which I which is obviously blown off by the uh, snows on it. Gate. Raised bed over there. Raised bed. If you can see that down here. More logs. 
this is my cooking crane which I built in, I don't know, Camp Update 7 or something I've got a sawhorse down there as well So whilst, whilst I love my camp that I've built and I'm very proud of it there are some flaws and I've never really talked about the downsides of it before um, the main kind of downsides and, and disadvantages of the, the type of shelter that I've got here is the top roof and the fire pit inside don't go too well together because also because I've built so many walls and it's so enclosed there's no airflow which means that the fire is always smoky and it smokes out the whole the whole shelter both the, the small secondary lean-to the primary lean-to behind me they just get smoked out and we've tried all different sorts of things we know it's the airflow we know it's the lack of airflow I've raised this I've, I've raised a little bit of a back wall with the stones here on the fire pit which has helped but my initial idea of having the fire pit inside the camp was so that to keep the shelters warm in the winter but as soon as we put that tarp roof on the smoke would come up and just fan out it would it would cool and then sink as smoke tends to do so you know maybe you guys can help me with this I'm thinking there's different options I could either I'm not I can't do a Dakota fire pit guys I've had a few people say do a Dakota fire hole it's it's so peaty the soil here as soon as it comes to summer I'll just it will just set all the tree roots alight in the forest alight and it will burn underground for hundreds of meters so Dakota fire pit is out the question I need to protect the forest floor if anything uh, this does have a metal plate underneath this fire pit to prevent the ash going through and burning all the ground so the options I had are I either run a drain pipe with a fairly big diameter along here to the outside of that wall because that's where the airflow is from that wall uh, so I, I run it underneath that wall into the fire pit here and that way the, it creates a draft and it draws the heat when it gets going will draw the air through and then produce much you know much a, a basically more of a flame much more heat a cleaner burn of the fire that's one option so let me know your thoughts on that uh, obviously it would be partially buried the, the pipe and I'd put dirt over ne over the top of it so that people you wouldn't trip on it so it wouldn't be visible that's one option the other option was to take that wall down and make it a kind of triangle and actually have the fire pit just outside the camp so there's still a wall there but the, there's no roof above the fire and that way it goes straight up out into the uh, into the forest. So let me just show you. So what I'm thinking is, as opposed to having the fire pit just here in the middle of the camp, taking this wall, putting it at a diagonal like that, and then having the fire pit down here, that way it's got clear area for the smoke to go up to the top of the forest canopy there. Whereas here you can see it's straight up into this tarp which, and the tarp's so low that it just smokes out under here and it gets caught under this shelter, caught under that shelter and smokes it out. So I'm thinking maybe have it out here, but still have this wall out there and maybe, maybe another wall, I don't know. Maybe leave it out and just have the fire pit out in the open. And that way, yes, it won't heat the shelters as much, but we're coming up to summer anyway, but it'll also uh, just allow for that better airflow because there's such a lack of airflow. Anyway, that's the wall that's just that's come down recently with the snow, with the rotten logs. That's easily fixable and it's within the shelter anyway. Um, a lot of you said on Camp Update 13 about pushing this part. We folded it up in here anyway, but pushing this part to the outside of the shelter so any rain that trickles down, you know, is going to come in between this gap here. It's going to come out underneath and trickle down the wood. So perhaps pushing it through which I'll do in another video, push it all through the other side so it all leaks outside that way and keeps it from coming in the shelter. That's one option as well. Just move that. Uh, this is great, this cooking crane works really well. Anyway, let's go up to the hunting tower. A uh, little bit of snow up here which is fine but it's still super solid. The walls are still solid in this. Look at this view. Roofs, roofs okay. There's a bit of snow on it. Up here, I have a 360 degree view. View. This is the tiki kitchen. Eventually, I'd like to have a a wood roof. Let me come outside a minute. But I'm still not sure how I'm going to do it. We've got this pole here holding this tarp up. I just would like a more permanent roof, but it's really difficult where I've built it. Perhaps you guys can help with the permanent roof. There's pictures on my Instagram of camp, so maybe you can look at that picture 
and see how I can build the roof because at the moment obviously there's this gap here so the snow came in there I don't know it's gonna be difficult let me know guys let me know in the comment section below if you would how you would do a roof here there's that tree obviously in the way but it could be used for support I don't know so I wanted to talk to you guys about uh, this new knife I'm using which is made for me by my friend Scott uh, he's called Wessex Blades he's a UK knife maker this is without doubt probably the best made knife I've ever seen and used it's a beast it's actually a beast I'm genuinely quite scared of this let me just show you so this is called a Luku okay I've never I've never really heard of a Luku before but this is beautiful I'll talk about the sheath in a minute <laughs> look at that that is something else that's a thing of beauty as I said made by Scott Wessex Blades uh, based in the UK he's a UK knife maker this is my first kind of proper UK handmade knife that is a beast there's his Scott's logo which he's etched in there this is incredible you saw me using it earlier I'm going to be using it in some more videos as well it's a beast it's it's heavy it's a heavy blade but it's got most of the weight near the tip it's got a slight little drop point there it's kind of got like a parangy look to it but it's not it's it's really unique I've never seen a blade like this uh, it's got the Scandi grind and he's put a tiny little micro convex on there just to give the blade a bit more strength because it it is used for for, for chopping and slicing but he's also it's clever because of the the sort of bulk of the weight is up here near the top for when you're doing that chopping action but as it, it narrows down and finds down to a much thinner part here which would be great for feather sticks and, and whittling so it's it's a sort of a great all-round knife lovely swell on the handle look at that that's so nice in the hand just to fit Scott's written me an, uh, an epic letter here I'm not gonna read the letter I'm just gonna read you some of the points because this is truly unique this so the, the steel is carbon steel and it's 52 100 steel which I've never heard of before uh, I think it's 4.7 mil thick you've got this part which you could be used for rocking motions for the food prep and then the weight down here near the tip for that chopping action so this is why when you see on survival shows and things like that they have big blades generally because they want a, they want an all-round knife and usually survival knives are all-round knife this is more designed to for bushcraft than survival the scales are again the scales that I've never had before they're called London plane which Scott has uh, cut up himself with his circular saw it's got red fiber liners there for me with Scott it's not just the the blades he makes but the sheaths are personally in my opinion the best knife sheaths I think I've ever had um, I've been following Scott on Instagram for ages and the leather work I'll pop a link to Scott's Wessex blades uh, and the video description below but the leather sheaths he makes are just incredible look how so this is uh, obviously black if I show you that there he's got his kind of Spartan the emblem there of the knight helmet that is so well made double stitched hand cut hand dyed hand stitched hand lock stitched all by hand tools and then on the back this is what I've been using it on the belt loop super super durable obviously the blade fits like a glove but it's also got this top down lip here fold over cover which makes it much more concealed obviously if you're carrying this around in public you will get pulled up for it in the UK but that's much more discreet than having your actual uh, handle there and it also protects the handle if it's raining and everything like that the handle is covered another very unique thing I don't know if you can see this is in the the welts there which is to stop the blade cutting into the leather he's actually got two red fiber liners hopefully you can see that here two red fiber liners which match the the knife itself I've never seen that before if that's not attention to detail I don't know what is but that's very very clever I, t I think that's probably the first time I've ever seen that in fact so I've already tested this out earlier and I intend to test it a lot more but just to show you with this weight forward and I split this for kindling this is the uh, the Luku, if it will balance, will it balance? It will with so with that weight being forward, I've probably hit this, split this wood with about the thickest part of the blade there. I mean, it makes 
mincemeat of it. Just incredible. I can't get over how much of a beast this knife is. Look, it just smashes through it. I'm going to use this part for the feather sits because this is what Scott was telling me is more for the whittling, this narrow part. So, this is the first time doing feather sticks with this knife. Okay. Look at the fine curls you can get from it. That's truly the best knife I've ever used so far. And that's a fact. I never, I've always been put off of, of big knives like this. I've always loved the traditional bushcraft knives and I always will do. I'm always drawn towards that classic Scandi bushcraft knife. But I guess when it comes to practicality of all-round tasks and you know when you're on multiple day trips and if you were going to carry one tool with you and not an axe I guess these knives this sort of Luku design Parang, Luku, Kukri, Machetes that's why they're used so much in the survival scene they're super fine Look at that. So, just so you can see, that's the, uh, the, the thicker curls here. That's the fine curls. I mean, they are so fine. It's not easy to <laughs> feather sticks this way, but... but but with that blade having such length to it, you can also just slice across the, the wood and get the finest curls. Normally I'd never do feather sticks like this, but I'm just trying to show you for the, for the camera. Bushcraft style chest lever grip, let's try that. Wow. Oh man. That absolutely, look how much material it takes off. Look at that. <laughs> it takes off so much material. I'll tell you the chunks of material, the, the thickness it's taking off. A bit more of a finesse. Thumb push works really well. I guess the downsides are that it is fairly heavy. It's a bulky knife to take. If you're on lightweight backpacking trips, I probably would say it's too bulky. That's probably a downside to it. But other than that, for me, it's really awesome. Let's try a draw cut. As I was showing in the snow video the other day, locking it on my knee, pulling the wood. That is ridiculous. I can't get over how much material it takes off compared to my normal bushcraft knives, my sort of standard classic ones. I would say with it being longer, pulling it back here, is, I'm not getting as much material off. Down near, near the choil, there is some power there. So I've got a bit of a broken fire still here. It's not my traditional one, my normal one that I bring. It's just one of a spare blank I've got in my bag. Yep, it works fine. Awesome. So I mentioned in the previous, I think it was the previous snow video actually, about the partnership with G-Stove and the discount code 
that they were going to give me, well, give you guys, uh, and I get, a, it's like an affiliate code, so I would get a commission from that discount code. So it's amazing, the D-Stove, for me, I use the heat view version, the smaller version. For me, it's, it's, well, it's, it's the best, it is one of the best, if not the best, in my opinion, wood stoves out there. For general, you see me hiking with it, you get what you pay for with a wood stove. I wouldn't be buying them regularly, I'd like to buy just the one, and that was it. That, I'd, I'd like to think that would last me most of my lifetime anyway. Um, but the great thing, and I think what makes g stove stand out from other people uh, and other stove companies, is the accessories that they have that come with it. They've got obviously the water boiling container, they've got the stove pipe oven with temperature gauge on, which I use regularly at the cabin with Dad. They've also got a clothes hanger, which I haven't featured yet, which dries clothes as well. You can hang your clothes from it. They've got a fan, which sits on top of the stove and runs via the heat of the stove itself. So it doesn't have, need any power, it just runs by the heat uh, and it pushes all that heat out, it circulates the heat around the room or the tent or the cabin that you're in. So they, they've given me a code guys and it will get you 15% off, which is a fairly significant amount uh, for any G-Stove product that applies to, accessories as well, uh, and it also works internationally. So whatever country you are that you're ordering your G-Stove from, uh, this code will work and all it is it's nice and simple it's just all in small case TA outdoors okay there's two ways you can use this code this TA outdoors code which will get you 15% off you can go onto the uh, G stove website if you're a new customer then you register an account which you do anyway to to buy anything from the G stove website you just register an account and then you write in my code underneath where it says uh, discount code so you write in TA outdoors and then when you log in you'll see that there's been a 15% discount on the prices that they that were previously shown. The other way of doing it is if you're already registered, uh, so if you've been on the G-Stove website and you're, you're a customer already, um, you go up into the top corner of the G-Stove website, they've got what's called the support center. So you go to that and then you click my page and on your page, this is your personal G-Stove page, you add a discount code, which is TA Outdoors. You add that code there and that way you guys will always see a 15% discount on Gisto products whenever you go on their website. It's like, a, it's like a permanent code almost that's there. So very grateful to them and I'm very grateful to you guys if you do end up using my code TA Outdoors to purchase anything. It really helps the channel out. Um, you know, obviously a lot of demonetization and everything that's happened to the channel about this time last year, it got hit quite bad. So um, I'm very grateful if you do end up using that code, that's super, super awesome. So thank you. So as well as G-Stove um, coming on board and, and helping me out, uh, I did say about meeting a, a, the chance for like a subscriber meetup. And I've, uh, the guys from the Bushcraft show this year have been in touch with me um, and they're looking to, I'm gonna help them out with some filming. So for those that don't know, the Bushcraft show is an annual weekend event um, on the uh, bank holiday weekend at the end of May. And it features, it's basically a huge outdoor show that features um, loads of bushcraft classes from the experts. Uh, it also f features uh, seminars and talks from bushcraft experts. There's loads of practical hands-on things that you can do. Um, there's, for example, this year, some of the expert speakers that are gonna be there is Ed Stafford, uh, Paul Kirtley, he's gonna be there, Will Lord. There's some unbelievable, you know, I mean, these are the, these are the top people uh, that are gonna be at this year's bushcraft show. They are the top of the top. As well as that, I'm, I'm going there with Jax and Emmy. So my wife is coming and Jax, my dog is gonna be there as well. Uh, and we're camping, we're getting a weekend ticket, we're gonna do some camping. Uh, and we will be probably camping out in the fields uh, as opposed to the woodlands. But yeah, I'm going this year. Uh, it'd be great to meet some of you guys. I'd be really interested to meet some of you and we can just chat uh, anything and everything bushcraft related, camping and things like that. And it'd just be awesome to meet you. I know loads of you have been asking about a meetup and the Bushcraft Show have been kind enough to offer you guys uh, a 15% discount as well on your tickets. So if you're interested in maybe coming for the weekend or the day, they do day tickets as well, but we're gonna be obviously there for the weekend. If you're interested in coming, use the discount code TAOutdoors15 on the Bushcraft Show website uh, at the checkout and that will get you 15% off your tickets, guys. So that'd be awesome. It'd be such a good opportunity to meet you. I'm very grateful for them for to be able to offer you a discount. I'll be doing some filming there as well. As I'm obviously helping them out with some filming and I'm gonna film a, a little vlog as well. So potentially you might be able to be on TA Outdoors as well. But for me, it's just a great opportunity to be able to meet you because I'm usually so busy, you know, scheduled with films and things like that. It's very hard to find an opportunity to actually 
uh, organise something like this. So rather than me organising it, uh, we've been in touch, obviously we've been talking with the Bushcraft Show and they've, uh, they've happily helped me out. So I'm really grateful for that. Grateful to the guys, that David and Olivia at the Bushcraft Show. There's live music in the evenings. Uh, there's bars there, so it'd be great to chat to you, some of you guys. And yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing some of you there. So TA Outdoors 15 at the Bushcraft Show website will get you 15% off your tickets. And remember, the G-Stove code is TA Outdoors, again, on their, uh, on their page, on their website. I will put links to in the video description to all of this information, including Scott's knife and everything. Bushcraft Show tickets, all the information is in the video description below, so you don't have to keep skipping back to this part uh, of this episode. So yeah, it's been awesome. Unfortunately, I'm not doing an overnighter tonight in the camp. A bit gutted. I've got to get back for um, for Jax and Emmy. Uh, I haven't planned to do an overnighter tonight. I just saw the snow forecast and came straight out here. About to pass 300,000 subscribers as well. Uh, so I'm super grateful for that. Thank you to all of you guys who are subscribed to the channel. It means a huge amount to me. I'm really pleased that you're enjoying the videos. Uh, I will state I'm not an expert, just so you know. I'm just learning along the way and and trying to pass on what i learned to you guys and hopefully um hopefully you see that in the videos don't forget to check out dad's youtube channel as well called ta fishing for weekly fishing videos we've got lots planned we have got lots planned the doors are opening i can't believe it like this this time last year i was on under 100,000 subscribers and there was no sponsorships really or anything like that and now there's doors opening with um with sponsors and you know and I appreciate that not everyone likes the sponsorships. I do appreciate that. And it can, you know, it can affect the, the quality of a video. But it won't be every video. Not, not all of my videos that will be sponsored. Uh, but it just helps me out, guys, because those of you who are on YouTube will know your revenue is like this. You know, it's just so up and down. It's so unpredictable what can happen. And things like last year where the demonetization hit, that was overnight. I woke up the next day and my revenue had halved. Imagine waking up the next day and your your job, your, the people you work for saying, we're giving you a 50% pay cut. That's, that's how it feels the next day and it just hit me. And it really damaged the channel quite a bit. So, um, you know, I worked hard, worked on through it, kept going. And, you know, I'm, at, I'm now at the stage where people are knocking on my door, sponsors are knocking on my door. And it's, it's a great thing because this is my full-time job. I have to be able to provide for my family. I have to be able to earn money at the end of the at the end of the day. But I appreciate that not everyone likes the sponsorships and the commercial side of it. But I hope you realise that it is so that I can. It's like a job. It's like you guys have a job. This is my job. Even if YouTube did stop paying me, I would still do this. It just wouldn't be on the regular basis that it is, and the and the quality would probably go down. So yeah, I would. I started the channel well before YouTube was monetized. Um, and I started TA Fishing. Well, we started that back in 2010, I think it was, or something like that, well before monetization came around. So we're well aware that it's still our passion to make these films, but it's just they won't, if, if, it, if I didn't have this income from YouTube and I wasn't full-time, the, the films would not be the quality that they are at the moment. So I hope you guys realize that and I hope you appreciate that. And I obviously I am aware that, that the commercial side of things, I'll, you know, a lot of people don't like it. I'm aware of that, but I hope you realize that this is me providing for my family as well. I'm trying to make a living from this. You know, it's not easy. It's the most unpredictable income I think I've ever known. It's so unpredictable. And it, it's so hard to know what's coming next. You know, they can hit us with anything, YouTube, with the demonetization and non-advertiser friendly content. There's no heads up at the moment. They just hit you with it. So I have to do these. I have to do these sponsored things every now and then. Because it, it's more security for me. Who wants to be in a job where there's no security? You know, there's no there's no knowledge of when you're going to be coming into work the next day. It's horrible. So, yeah, hopefully you understand that, guys. I appreciate those of you who have stuck by regardless and, and just watch the, the commercial sponsored parts. You know, I, I do really appreciate that. And the people who use the codes. That's super helpful. Anyway, thanks so much. If you're still watching this episode, I appreciate it. It's been a bit of a ramble here in the woods, but it's been so nice to just enjoy it. So peaceful. And I've got plans to be back at camp soon. Once this snow goes, I've got to do some tidying up here. I've got to retie some of the walls, get the structures a bit better, a bit more sturdy. There will be plans potentially for another, another camp update. What, what do you guys think? What would you add to this camp? I'm almost done with what I can add to this camp, but I'm sure you have plenty of ideas. So let me know with the roof suggestions if you can. I'm very grateful for you for watching this video. If you're still sticking around, thank you so much. And I will see you guys in the next episode.
Oh yeah, patches coming soon too. Follow me on Instagram for information on that. <laughs>